join me in welcoming David Grinspoon to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I uh, want to tell you a little bit about my new book, Earth in Human Hands, and uh, sort of why I wrote it and what's in it. And um, then I will be sure and leave some time to hear your questions and ideas and comments and have a little discussion. So what I would like to do is start right off with reading you a little excerpt from the book that is right from the very beginning and is my attempt to answer the question, why is an astrobiologist writing a book about the human presence on Earth? After all, we study life on other planets. Um, but this was my attempt to apply astrobiology to the question of humans on Earth. And um, so I'm going to read you a little bit of that tries to explain that. Oh, before I do that, um, I have a first slide queued up that um, seemed uh, I wanted to honor, whoops, wanted to honor the great Martin Luther King Jr. on this week of his birthday. And um, I have this quote that I really love that I, I almost put in the book and then I didn't have the right place for it. But I, in a way, for me, it sums up part of what I'm trying to reach for in this book, where Dr. King talked about that if we're going to uh, do a good job being together on this planet and working through some of our problems, then we have to develop a, what he called a world perspective. And it's my view that a deep consideration of who we are and what we are on this planet through the scientific appreciation of the long story of Earth, the deep time and deep space picture that we gain of ourselves through planetary science and astrobiology, that it leads us naturally to what we might call a world perspective. So just wanted to find a way to work that in. Um, now I'm going to read you a little bit from the, uh, the introduction. And this is called, from a section called, A Planetary Perspective on the Human Predicament. Let me find a spot where the lighting is good. Oh, here we go. Gazing over the countless fluctuations and transformations in Earth's multi-billion year history, I am struck by the unique strangeness of the present moment. We suddenly find ourselves sort of running a planet, a role we never anticipated or sought, without knowing how it should be done. We're at the controls, but we're not in control. This book is my view of how we got into this situation and where that leaves us now. A child of the space age, I grew up captivated by the romance of planetary exploration. My timing was right to become a NASA research scientist working in the new field of astrobiology, the scientific study of life in the universe. My participation in the spacecraft exploration of other planets has informed my view of our presence on this one. In these pages, I'll describe how we humans fit into the long-term story of Earth and how I believe this knowledge can help us to navigate our current time of environmental stress and uncertainty about the future. Although climate change is the most obvious, it is only one of a large number of interconnected ways in which we have suddenly begun to modify the planet we inhabit. The scientific community is now converging on the idea that we have entered a new phase, or epoch, of Earth history, one in which the net activity of humans has become a powerful agent of geological change, equal to the other great forces of nature that build mountains and shape continents and species. The proposed name for this new epoch is the Anthropocene, or the Age of Humanity. This concept challenges us to look at ourselves in the mirror of deep time, measured not just in decades or centuries or even in millennia, but over hundreds of thousands and hundred, oh, sorry, over hundreds of millions and billions of years. We are witnessing and manifesting something unprecedented and still completely unpredictable, the advent of self-aware geological change. As an astrobiologist, I study the possible evolutionary relationships between life and the planets that may host it. I see the Anthropocene as a tricky new step 
in the long, intricate dance between Earth and its biosphere that has been going on for four billion years. There are those who object to the name Anthropocene as being too self-aggrandizing and serving a destructive, human-centered viewpoint. But this epoch is well-named because it represents a recognizable turning point in geological history brought about by one species, anthro. And our growing recognition of this inflection can be a turning point in our ability to respond to the changes we've set in motion. I believe that more than the extreme and undeniable physical changes to the planet being caused by human influence, it is this dawning self-recognition that is fundamentally different and ultimately promising about the Anthropocene. Many species have changed the planet to the benefit or detriment of others, but there has never before been a geological force aware of its own influence. I'm gonna skip down and read you a couple other little snippets that are also from the, uh, the beginning of the book. It may seem circuitous to begin a book about the human role on Earth by talking about the exploration of other planets. I will try to make the case, however, that looking homeward from the vantages we've gained through our interplanetary journeys gives us valuable perspective for navigating the planetary scale changes we are now facing and causing. We need to learn all that we can about how planets work so we can make the transition from inadvertently messing with Earth to thoughtfully, artfully, and constructively engaging with its great systems. The planetary perspective allows us to step away from the noise of the immediate present to see ourselves from a distance in time lapse. When we do so, what we see is not just a problem facing our civilization, but an entirely new evolutionary stage in the development of life. In seeing ourselves as a geological process, we also see the planet entering a phase where cognitive processes are becoming a major agent of global change. Earth's biosphere gave birth to these thought processes, which are now in turn feeding back and reshaping its changing planetary cycles. A planet with brains? Fancy that. Not only brains, but limbs with which to manipulate and build tools. We are just beginning to come to grips with this strange new development. Like an infant staring at its hands, we are becoming aware of our powers, but have not yet gained control over them. The planetary perspective provides a kind of out-of-body experience for us, hovering in orbit and watching ourselves sleepwalk through a slow disaster of our own making. Now, can this experience help us to shake ourselves awake? For virtually all its history, Earth has evolved without us, and we have always seen ourselves as autonomous actors on a passive planetary backdrop. But now, we are beginning to see that our futures, those of humanity and of planet Earth, are tightly conjoined. If human civilization is to persist and thrive, we will need a completely different view of our planet and of ourselves, in which we acknowledge both our deep dependence and our increasing influence. We need visions of a future in which we have applied our infinite creativity to the task of living on a finite world where we have embraced our role, become comfortable and proficient as planet shapers, and learn to use our technological skills to enhance the survival prospects, not just of humanity, but of all life on Earth. My name for this vision is Terra Sapiens, or Wise Earth. A recent scientific breakthrough enriches this story, the exoplanet revolution. As we long suspected and have now confirmed, the universe, this universe is full of planets orbiting nearly every star. It is now very close to inconceivable that we could be the only life and only technological intelligence in the universe. An interplanetary perspective on Earth's current dilemmas incites us to wonder whether parallel dramas may have unfolded on distant worlds. Do other planets grow inventive brains that end up causing themselves problems? 
Do other species develop technology and build civilizations that create dangerous instabilities on their planets? How do they cope? Do planetary biospheres become self-aware? The Anthropocene leads us to a new way of looking at SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which in turn illuminates changing notions about ourselves, how we fit into our planet, and what kind of future we dare imagine. 100 million years from now, what will our time have been? A brief climate spasm that Earth shrugged off and largely forgot, leaving a thin layer infused with bizarre plastic objects? Or the beginning of a lasting new phase when the biosphere finally woke up and adjusted its grip on the planet? Okay, so that's um, a little bit from the beginning where I, I sort of set the stage for the book. And then the, um, the first chapter is called Listening to the Planets. And in, in Listening to the Planets, I, I describe what we've learned in the last um, really 70 years of um, exploring the solar system with a focus on what we've learned about our own planet from exploring other planets. And it turns out we've, we've learned a lot about Earth that we never would have figured out or w maybe eventually would have, um, but it would have taken us much longer without these journeys to other planets because when you have other examples, it reveals things about this example that, that you couldn't see otherwise. So just the ability, first of all, to go into space and, and see ourselves from orbit has revealed so much about our planet, and then the ability to actually study other planets and compare their life stories and the way they have diverged uh, from Earth. And divergence is a good word to use. It turns out that when we look at the nearest neighbors, and a lot of my research has involved this trio of worlds, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and when, when we look at this trio of these three Earth-like planets, what we learn is that they started out a lot more similar than they are today. Uh, they really were sort of triplets when they were, were young. Uh, Venus and Mars both had, we believe, we have evidence for, both had oceans and moderate climates and the kind of geological activity that facilitates an origin of life. And it's possible that all three planets experienced an origin of life, but um, there's only one planet in which it obviously stuck. Uh, and then, so these three planets started out very similar, and then each of them went through a catastrophic change when it was still relatively young. In the case of Venus, it experienced a runaway greenhouse where it lost its oceans and just became a, uh, you know, a self-cleaning oven. It's really, really hot there. I mean, no, no organic life could live on the surface, at least. Um, and Mars had the opposite problem. It, it also lost its atmosphere, but mostly due to small gravity, uh, most of its atmosphere and most of its water, and it froze over and uh, also became geologically quiescent and um, seemingly lost its abilities to support life, at least certainly life on the surface. And Earth also went through a catastrophic change when it was fairly young. It came to life. And not only was there an origin of life, but then life quickly proliferated and sort of took over the planet. And it may seem strange to hear me describe that as a catastrophe, but I mean that in a, it, it, scientifically sometimes we use the word catastrophe just to mean a radical change in state, a sudden and radical change in state. And the more we study Earth, especially with the um, advantage of uh, the space age perspective, the more we learn how deeply life has transformed our planet. Not just in the obvious ways of, you know, the, act, the, the atmosphere's weird compared to a lifeless planet, all this oxygen and methane and other things that are byproducts of life, but even the rocks themselves, two-thirds of the minerals, more than two-thirds of the minerals on Earth, uh, turns out are, are um, indirect byproducts of the effects of biology on the planet. And uh, the hydrological cycle, all these different cycles, the carbon cycle, the sulfur cycle, um, even it turns out perhaps, and this is still controversial, the interior cycles of Earth's mantle, the convection of the interior is indirectly affected by the presence of life because life 
so change has so changed the chemistry of the planet that changes the material and the properties of the interior of the planet. So, so um, Earth has been fully taken over by life, and that was a major transition when the planet was young. And that's one of, um, I talk about three big realizations of um, the space age, big realizations of our, about our planet. And one was uh, what we call plate tectonics, you know, that, that Earth's surface is split into about a dozen rigid plates that slide around and bash into each other and pull apart, and that bashing and pulling, that sort of bumper cars of the tectonic plates, we call plate tectonics, is what causes most of the geological action on Earth. But it goes deeper than that, too, because plate tectonics is a manifestation of the interior churning of the Earth, and sort of these plates are riding around on this churning interior. And it's, it's basically the, the idea that unites all of our Earth science understanding, plate tectonics. And it came about, um, it was uh, um, considered fringe at the beginning of the space age, and about 10 years into the space age, it, it had become the, the new paradigm. And it wasn't just because of exploring space, we were also exploring the deep ocean. And um, strangely, both of those efforts, the, uh, the uh, space age uh, exploration of the solar system with rockets and the, the mapping of the deep ocean floor, both of those were byproducts of the Cold War. So there's a weird interface between um, military um, competition and self-understanding on the Earth, and I, I talk about that a little bit in the book. Another interesting thing is that this same time period when we were first exploring the planets and first really seeing ourselves in a new way as, as, as a result was also the time period that scholars of the Anthropocene called the Great Acceleration that really started um, in the 1950s. If you graph human influence on Earth in all these different ways, you know, the changes in the atmosphere, CO2, and human population, and the damming of rivers, the changes in the hydrological cycle, deforestation, all these measures that we can make of how humans are influencing the Earth. The, all these graphs sort of look the same if you squint. They all kind of go up gradually in the 18th and 19th and 20th century. And then around 1950, post-war, they all shoot up radically and sort of frighteningly in this, uh, this phenomenon that we call the Great Acceleration. And it's interesting to me that that same time period is exactly the same time period as, as when the space age happened. And in a certain way, that's fortunate because even though it's alarming to see that the extent of our influence on the planet and, and realize that we need to get a handle on ourselves, it's also fortuitous that during that same time period, it was when we first could see, really uh, understand and see our influence, see the Earth from a distance, map the Earth in all these different wavelengths from orbit, and uh, you know, get this time-lapse portrait of our planet changing, including what we're doing to the planet. If we didn't have that picture, that view of ourselves provided by that, the space age, but we're still causing all that influence, then we'd be in much worse shape. We'd really be driving blind, in a sense, and wouldn't have at least the capability to see what we're doing and consider changing course. So that's, that's that chapter, um, Listening to the Planets. And the, the, the next chapter um, in the book is called Can a Planet Be Alive? And that's where I really talk about the influence of life on the planet and the way in which Earth really did go through this radical junction, radical transition that differentiated it from the neighbors due to the fact that Earth came to life. And, and I talk some about, you may have heard of the Gaia hypothesis, which is a somewhat controversial, but I think very useful idea to consider the role of life on Earth because uh, when you really look at Earth and life deeply and the long history of life sort of taking over our planet, you realize that there is a real sense in which it's not true that Earth is just a place that has some life living on it. It's much more true to say that Earth, in a sense, became alive, that the planet came to life, and that life became this force that uh, is deeply interwoven with the evolution of the planet. So that's sort of a junction in the history of the planet when, when life happened and life took over. And then, I, as I tell the story, I suggest that what we're encountering now, in a certain sense, with the 
appearance of humans and then the accelerating influence of um, human so-called civilization on our planet um, is, is another juncture, another branching point, um, which could potentially be as significant as the origin of life. This appearance of cognitive life, of self-aware geological change. Um, if it's not to be just a flash in the pan, then that self-awareness becomes a part of the mechanism of change. And that, I maintain, just from a sort of systems analysis point of view, is as profound a change in the evolution of the planet and of life as, um, as the origin of life and some of the other major junctures that have happened in Earth's history. So I try to um, develop that view of us as uh, not just another species that's come along, not just a species that's having trouble getting a handle on itself, but as potentially a uh, fundamentally new phase in the evolution of the planet. And the chapter where I introduce this notion of, of human influence and try to sum up human influence. It's the third chapter in the book and it's called Monkey with the World. And uh, I'm going to read you just the very beginning of this chapter um, where I uh, talk about looking at the earth in time lapse and then what happens when humans show up. And yeah, so this, this is just the very beginning of of monkey with the world, it's, it's uh, a section called Something New. It begins with a quote by the Grateful Dead, for those of you that are into that kind of thing. Who can stop what must arrive now? Something new is waiting to be born. Something new. Have you noticed that something strange is happening to Earth? Take a good long look at this world, a dazzling blue orb festooned with spiraling clouds, spinning through star-flecked darkness day side glinting in slowly brightening sun, winter white pulsing between north and south as Earth ambles through its orbit. Now, imagine you are a very patient alien regarding Earth over the eons. If you've been watching carefully for, say, the last several billion years, you've seen a lot happen. The brown continents drifting around the oceanic globe, coalescing and breaking apart animated pieces in a morphing spherical puzzle. The polar caps growing and shrinking, advancing and retreating as climate rocks between ice age and hothouse. Throughout all these changes, the night side remains a nearly unbroken black, and the day side continents are the stark, dull gray of bare rock. After four billion lonely years, a green fringe first edges over the land and the night starts to sparkle with occasional forest fires. Still, for the longest time, the unlit hemisphere remains as black as the starry space surrounding it, the dark interrupted only by these fleeting fires and by occasional flash of lightning or splash of aurora. Until, very recently, in the last few hundred years, just a twitch in the life of the planet. Whoa, what is this? Something new. Suddenly, the planet lights up in a peculiar spidering pattern that seems to reflect an organic process, but something else as well, something cognitive. Starting in a few isolated river valleys and coastal areas, glowing points appear, abruptly dotting the night, then stitching together and spreading along widening and brightening webs, hugging the shores, and eventually growing in loose nodal patterns across the interiors of the lands. On the day side, a mesh of dark lines becomes visible, winding between the locations of those night lights, each swiftly surrounded by a growing verdant grid of novel angular geometry. Soon, regular movements of small wave-generating objects start crossing the oceans, and bright linear clouds start streaking the skies. At the same time, a host of other accelerating changes are observable in the atmosphere, the land, the oceans, and the ice. Finally, just 60 years ago, a blink and you missed it interval in this fast forward view began the curious anti-accretion with small bits of earth stuff jumping into space. Little insect-like constructions of refined metal bristling with sensors, thrusters, and radio antennae started leaping off planet, sailing first to the nearest worlds and then to those farther afield. 
sending pictures and other information home to their inquisitive builders, signaling the arrival on Earth of curiosity and gravity-defying technology. Yes, after billions of years of geology as usual, something new and strange is definitely happening here. What is the meaning of these new changes? And then, I tell you, in the next um, couple hundred pages. The, um, so that, that's the beginning of Monkey with the World, where I sort of sum up human influence, um, again, with the lens of uh, sort of trying to look at humanity from the planet's point of view, of like all the different things Earth has been through and what it's going through now and how it sort of stacks up and what, what is new about this new agent of change. And, and then the, the next section of the book is uh, something I call planetary changes of the fourth kind. And it comes from an effort to really define what is so new about how Earth is changing now compared to all that it's been through. Because one thing I point out is that we're not the first species to come along and radically change the planet. And um, it, you know, even to the point where uh, it's very detrimental for other species. Um, for instance, two and a half billion years ago, about um, these little guys, the cyanobacteria, they look innocent enough, don't they? But um, they uh, came along and proliferated and basically wrecked, wrecked the world. And they, what they did was they discovered a new energy source. And they said, oh, let's exploit the hell out of this new energy source. And they, they multiplied. And they were so successful at that that they polluted the atmosphere with a dangerous chemical that, that uh, killed off lots of other life and caused a horrible climate catastrophe. And the what these guys, the cyanobacteria, did was they discovered solar energy and photosynthesis. They discovered how to use sunlight to uh, break up uh, water and carbon dioxide and make organic stuff, make food, make their own bodies. Um, and uh, that created a byproduct, this dangerous gas that filled up the atmosphere, O2, oxygen, which, of course, sounds strange because we love oxygen. You know, I, I know I do. <sighs> yeah, it's good stuff. But that's because we've evolved the, capa the capacity to take advantage of the powerful reactions that happen when oxygen meets organic molecules. Oxygen destroys organic molecules, and that's why it was so dangerous when it first came along. It destroys organic molecules and releases energy. Now, if you can evolve the capacity to harness that energy, then you've tamed fire. And that's basically what we do. It's called respiration. And we've got enzymes where we use that powerful reaction between oxygen and organics. In every cell of, our, of your body, there's a little power, power plant that, that does that, does respiration. So um, you know, life has a way, evolution has a way of you know, sort of making lemonade <laughs> out of lemons. And so that dangerous, um, what we call the oxygen catastrophe, led, of course, to a lot of further evolution, including including us. So it doesn't seem like such a catastrophe now, maybe, but, but at the time, it, 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 it remains the most radical um, chemical transformation in Earth's history. Now, this leads me to wonder, you know, what, what have we got that the cyanobacteria didn't have? Because we, we, we tell that story, and we, we don't say, oh, those irresponsible cyanobacteria, how could they? We don't say that because they're just bacteria, right? But we see ourselves behaving in that same way, sort of. I mean, we, uh, those of us that are paying attention feel some great responsibility and, and concern about that. So what's the difference, really? You know, this is just another way of getting at the vexing question of human uniqueness. And in, in an effort to answer that question, I've sort of looked at the different kinds of catastrophic changes that can happen to planets. And I've decided there are four kinds of planetary catastrophe. Uh, categorized with respect to the influence of life. So what I call planetary changes of the first kind are, 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 are sort of random catastrophes, and that's um, what happens when you know a big asteroid hits, like the one that did in the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and 75% of all the other species at that time. Or another example of a random change is some, uh, a random catastrophe is something happens to the interior convection of the Earth, and it goes through you know, there's a little volcanic burp from the perspective of the Earth. It's just a little volcanic burp, from, but from the perspective of the biosphere, it causes massive climate change and a, a mass extinction. And there have been a few times when this has happened. So these are catastrophes, 
changes where life has nothing to do with it. Life is just an innocent bystander. And all planets will have some level of this, this kind of change. What I call planetary changes of the second kind are, are biologically induced catastrophes. And I already gave you a great example of, of that, which is when solar energy came along, when photosynthesis came along, it um, radically changed the planet and wiped out a lot of other species, which is why I'm using the leaf to symbolize this kind of change. This is, these are catastrophes that happen just when some species or some group of species comes along and evolves some capacity that um, allows them to thrive but changes the planetary environment in a way that is detrimental to other species and can cause sometimes a mass extinction. Now, the th what I call planetary changes of the third kind are, are inadvertent catastrophes. And that's what we're dealing with now. Um, this is what happens when you have a species, a, a, a clever species that evolves uh, technology and some ability to work together in groups. And, and they, they're so good at using technology to solve local survival problems and modify their environment that they proliferate around the world and modify their environments more. And without having any idea that at first that they are doing so, they end up changing their global environment in dangerous ways. And I think it's almost inevitable, and I've, I've thought about this a, a lot, uh, that if, um, if technological intelligence evolves on another planet, that it will first go through a stage like this. Because why would you think you could change the world if you're just living in some space and developing technology? The world is this impervious thing, and it would, uh, I think, always sort of come as a shock that you would realize that, that you have this world-changing capacity, especially if you develop technology before you develop a space program, which I think would be the usual order of things. Um, so you can look at this as, um, you know, from a systems analysis or, or, or from cognitive development analysis uh, as um, it's dangerous when an organism has a sphere of influence that exceeds its sphere of awareness. Think of a child that lacks situational awareness or that you're, you wish would learn more situational awareness and sort of crashing into things. When you're acting on a, a, in a realm or in a sphere or domain that exceeds your awareness, then you, um, you're not in control and you can do dangerous things. And cognitively, collectively, humanity is mostly but not completely at that stage. If you think of um, this um, traffic jam here, these individual cars are being driven by uh, people with agency. They can see obstacles coming and steer around them. They can slow down if they need to and so forth. But collectively, is anybody driving the global transportation system? And the answer is not really, right? So this is what I call the Anthropocene dilemma, this um, having a domain of influence that exceeds awareness. And there's some um, obvious examples of this um, most Crucially right now, a lot of us are aware of the um, rise of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is called the Keeling Curve. You've probably seen this, um, that just over my lifetime, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has risen by about 30%. And you can see this is a few years old. Now it would say over 400 parts per million. Um, and this is a nifty animation that I got from the California Academy of Sciences showing a year of CO2 and CO in the atmosphere. And you, it's, it's kind of neat if you watch it, you can see the, the sources are concentrated in a lot of the industrialized areas and the sinks where it's disappearing is concentrated in a lot of the forested areas. And there's also the white stuff in this simulation is, is carbon monoxide, which you can see is sourced a lot of places where there are uh, forest fires like down here in uh, Sumatra um, and here in Central Africa. Um, anyway, so we, um, as you've heard, I'm not the first to tell you this news, have a, a problem with our carbon dioxide emissions. And this leading to things like the, um, the scary uh, disappearance of the uh, sea ice in the Arctic and so forth. So these are some examples of uh, what I call inadvertent catastrophe. Uh, another good example is the ozone hole, and you've heard about this, where in the 1970s, Largely because it turns out, largely it turns uh, largely because we were exploring the, the planet Venus and studying some obscure chemistry in the upper atmosphere of Venus, 
and discovered that chlorine does weird things to ozone and other oxygen compounds, um, that led to the discovery that we were harming the ozone layer of, of Earth. And um, it's an unintended consequence of some new technology that we thought was very safe, introducing these refrigerants where they were supposed to be safe and non-toxic and environmentally better than the, what we were using before. And they were safe and non-toxic and better down here in the troposphere where we live out our lives, but nobody anticipated what will happen when we use these enough and some of them start to leak up into the stratosphere where there's a lot more ultraviolet light that can nick off some of these chlorines from the CFCs, the, the C in the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons is chlorine. And when that happens, those naked chlorines um, start attacking ozone like crazy and that led to this dangerous situation. It's a great example of an unintended consequence. It was very clever to introduce those chemicals, but not clever enough. Uh, we didn't see all, the, you never can see all the possible consequences. Anyways, this is an example of an inadvertent change, but it's also a good example of the next kind of change I want to discuss, which are planetary changes of the fourth kind, intentional changes, because the story of the ozone layer is, um, is hopeful in that what happened once some scientists discovered this was happening, they sort of alerted the world, there was a big discussion, global discussion about it, actually an argument, and there was a lot of um, confusion and all the things that are happening now with carbon dioxide happened with ozone there. The companies that were profiting from making the CFCs seeded um, sort of fake science. Uh, they, they, um, they paid experts to say that it was uh, you know, that it wasn't true and that they said it was a hoax and all this stuff that you see playing out now. But the truth won out in this case and um, there were global agreements made and global treaties, the Montreal Protocol for the uh, regulation of ozone um, harming substances, it's called something like that, um, was signed and um, the companies that were making the CFCs phased them out partly because they realized they could make a profit from introducing the replacement chemicals. Um, so, um, but anyway, so this is a success story and it indicates that we at least have the capacity for a different kind of relationship with, um, with the world. That, um, that we, uh, not that it's easy or always going to be easy or that we will always succeed, but this is an existence proof that we are able to see a global threat and uh, make some kind of a global um, agreement and uh, respond intentionally and um, in, our, in our own interest and in the biosphere's interest. Some other possible examples of this fourth kind of planetary change, obviously and most crucially mitigating um, global warming, which is an effort uh, in which, uh, believe it or not, there is a lot of progress being made. Um, solar energy and wind energy are getting cheaper. Uh, w whether it's enough progress fast enough to avoid a lot of damage is an entirely different question, and that, which I'll come back to probably a little bit. But, um, but that, it, certainly it's, it's in this category of intentional change. Now thinking farther in the future, one could imagine that if we are successful in getting, off, getting beyond our current um, spate of climate vandalism, and one way or another we will get beyond that, um, then one can imagine other ways in which we could apply this kind of planetary change. There are other threats on longer time scales which um, would be very, very harmful or fatal to not just us and our civilization but to other species on the planet. For instance, I mentioned the dinosaurs and what happened to them with that big asteroid. Space is full of, uh, I think I even have an animation of this space. Is, oh yeah, this is cool. I also got this from the California Academy of Sciences. These are the orbits of the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth. Each one of these other streaks, these are all the positions of known Earth-crossing asteroids. Each, this is data. Each one of these is a real object that we know about out there that could eventually strike the Earth. This is, of course, vastly sped up. Um, but the point is space is full of stray objects and sooner or later another one will hit the Earth. I mean, a little ones hit it all the time. Sooner or later another big one, if we don't do anything or if nobody does anything about it. 
but we actually know how to track these things and identify them far in advance, and there's some ideas that are not too far-fetched that we would be able to um, do something about it. So in the long run, there are ways in which we could play potentially a more constructive role and even sort of think of a, a kind of payback to the biosphere. Yeah, we're causing a lot of extinction now and we need to cut it out as quickly as possible, but in the long run, we could easily, we ought to be able to prevent the next mass extinction and the one after that. Another kind of threat is climate change. We have the illusion that if we just are hands off and left the climate alone, that Earth would be a fine place for children and other living beings for forever, that, that it, Earth is a paradise left to itself. But it is an illusion because we've come along in an unusual time in Earth history. Our entire civilization has sprung up in this 10,000 year period of stable and warm climate that is actually very unusual um, in Earth history, or it would be unusual if it lasted because uh, climate goes through cycles. And if we wait long enough, there will be another ice age. Um, 10,000 years, maybe more like probably 50,000 years, but sooner or later left to its own devices, um, the Earth would experience climate changes that are much more severe than the ones we're worried about right now. Our civilization would not survive another ice age and a lot of other species would um, be taken out as well. But it's, um, I think it's reasonably safe to say that if we are able to mitigate our current level of climate change, then it's not going to be that hard a problem, given, especially given 50,000 years to work the problem, to tweak the climate a little bit purposefully to prevent an ice age. So after we get over, as I said, this sort of reckless phase, then there may be a phase where we want to uh, not take our hands entirely off the wheel, but become something of um, stewards uh, of the planet and try to uh, may maybe pay back the biosphere a little bit for the damage we're doing now. So that's, those are the kinds of things I mean when I talk about planetary changes of the fourth kind. Um, I want to wrap up pretty soon here because I want to make sure we have time for questions, but I have a couple more things I wanted to mention. The, um, so, yeah, so there's planetary changes of the fourth kind, and then the next chapter in the book is called Terra Sapiens, and I go into more detail about my, my sort of hopeful vision of the kind of role that an enlightened technological civilization could play on a planet. Uh, where technology becomes something used in the service of actually uh, protecting life as opposed to threatening it. Um, so that's Terra Sapiens, Wise Earth. Uh, and then the, the next two chapters are called Intelligent Worlds in the Universe and Finding Our Voice. And there I talk a little bit more about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And the reason I go there is because when you start thinking about the far future possibilities, the possibility of, of great longevity of a technological civilization and what that might mean, um, you realize that you're in the same territory as people that study SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, because when, when you do the math of SETI, and people have been doing this for really since the same period of time, actually, as the space age and the great acceleration, people first started think, theorizing and attempting um, to find messages from aliens, really around that same time, the very beginning of the 1960s. Um, but when you do the math, what you learn, what you quickly realize is that it all comes down to the question of longevity. That if you assume that technological species generally don't last long, maybe less than a thousand years, um, because it's difficult to survive with powerful world-changing technology and you're gonna have a nuclear war or climate disaster or GMO disaster or something. If, if it's something that cannot be handled and civilizations are typically short-lived, then when you look at, when you model the number of, and distribution of, of civilizations in the galaxy, you conclude there's probably going to be nobody to talk to. Because it may not mean that there's literally nobody out there, but it means that two species won't be close enough in space so that they're around at the same time so that given the limitations of the speed of light, they could actually detect or um, maybe even make contact with one another. So if species don't, if civilizations don't last long, they can't find each other. If, on the other hand, it's possible to make this transition to great longevity, which I put in terms of um, 
learning to make planetary changes of the fourth kind as opposed to planetary changes of the third kind. If it's possible to get a handle on one's technological self and use that in the service of great longevity so that you have some civilizations that are lasting much longer, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe even tens or hundreds of millions of years, then they should be all over the place and you should be able to find them. Um, and so there's a hopeful aspect to this. You realize that the, the problem of SETI in a way is the same as the problem we're facing now. If, uh, can, the, it's the same question. The question is, can a technological civilization find a way to live comfortably over the long haul with world-changing technology? Um, so that turns out to be the, set, the, the central question of SETI. And it, it, in, by looking at ourselves, you, you know, it's a trick of sort of turning the telescope back around and looking at ourselves from a somewhat more distant perspective and, and trying to realize the essence of the problem we're facing now. So that's why I talk about that. It's also, by the way, this perspective leads us to a different way of thinking about possibly detecting other civilizations because we're, we've been very focused on, on listening for radio signals, which makes sense because we have radio tel telescopes and we realized in the end of the 1950s that if other civilizations have radio telescopes too that you could communicate across interstellar distances, somebody might be doing that. Why not try to listen? But if there are no radio signals, it doesn't mean there are, other civ there are no other civilizations. It may mean that there's all kinds of reasons for that that have been explored. Maybe radio is a, a dumb way to communicate and anybody who's really smart has realized that it's, you know, that's like, that would be like us trying to use uh, tin cans and little, um, you know, pieces of thread. Or uh, maybe they have no interest in talking to primitive species like us. Maybe that would be like you trying to discuss philosophy with a frog. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why they might not be sending signals, but they could be there. But if you, if you go to this model where inevitably an advanced civilization will start to alter its planet in the service of longevity, then you can look for those altered planets. So there's a way in which, um, you know, we talk about in astrobiology, we talk about looking for biosignatures, um, looking for what life does to a planet, you know, oxygen or other chemical things. But I talk in here a little bit about, well, we could also look for technosignatures. You know, we don't have to find signals. We could just look for planets that betray the existence of a civilization that's been there for a long time and is sort of taking care of the planet in various ways. It just, it gives us another way to think about the search, especially when we're at this threshold of being able to actually start to examine exoplanets. It's just something that we can keep in mind. Um, and then the, the final, the penultimate chapter is called, um, the penultimate chapter is called Finding Our Voice. And it's about, there's a, there's a debate going on right now within the SETI community about whether we should be sending messages or just listening. And it's a, it's a surprisingly impassioned debate. There are people, very smart people with, I think, very good arguments on both sides. Um, and I, 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 I'm not gonna go really far into that now because I wanna wrap this up, but it's, it's an interesting debate because it sums up some of these core questions that I've been wrestling with in this book. Can we find some sort of coherent sense of self? Is it okay for somebody to just message or sh um, and speak for Earth, or should we attempt to have some kind of global buy-in? We're never gonna have total global buy-in, but maybe it's worth trying to make the effort. Maybe that is in itself as important as anything that might be transmitted. And then further, what would we say? You know, How would we try to represent ourselves to another um, civilization out there? It's just another way of trying to sum up and look at ourselves from that uh, slightly more cosmic perspective. So finally, the last chapter is called Embracing the Human Planet. And I'm gonna read you just a snippet of that and then um, stop and take questions. So in this, in this chapter, Embracing the Human Planet, um, I talk a little bit about the long relationship between human beings and climate change, which is very interesting. If you look at the, the long history of how we got to be the way we are today, you find that a lot of the major evolutionary developments, breakthroughs, innovations that led to um, the existence of modern humans came about through facing climate crisis. Um, our uh, starting to walk upright, some of our development of social cooperation and language, our domestication of fire, um, the acceleration of having large brains, a lot of these things that we think of sort of the defining characteristics of human. It turns out a lot of those developments came about through various climate crises that we faced and then 
survived by, in a way, becoming successively more human and learning to cooperate and use language and forge more complex kinds of technologies. So there's a way in which climate change made us what we are today. And I find that kind of hopeful because it implies in a certain sense that, that we are fundamentally climate change survival machines. And then maybe that means in a certain way we need to just get better at doing what we've done. And the, there's a chapter, uh, there's a section on that I call Becoming More Human, where in a way we just need to make that next leap. We're pretty good at cooperating in groups of a certain size and being innovative and clever. And if we just make that one next leap to being able to do it globally, then, then maybe that's what makes us fully human. Um, so the last thing I do in this book is I talk about pessimism and optimism. And I, I give a kind of taxonomy of pessimism. And I talk about different sources of pessimism and how um, I find some of them suspect or, or not very helpful. There's a potential for um, sort of a toxic fatalism that I, that I caution against. Um, and then, so I, and there's a section, and my section about that is called The Power of Negative Thinking. And then the very end of the book, I'm going to read you now, where I then talk about different kinds of optimism. Okay, it's not quite the very end. I'm not going to read you the very end because I, I don't want you to know how it ends. <laughs> I want you to read it. But so I'm, this is almost the end of the book. I'm leaving, going to leave out the last two paragraphs. Okay. Right now, the subject of the future is rife with anxiety. Oh, wait, I even have another slide to go with this. Got to remember, I'm, I'm multimedia here. I'll, li I'll leave this out, but this is my redrawing of the geologic time scale, which you've seen before, but my, you've seen all these different layers, but mine goes into the future <laughs> with the sapiozoic eon. If you want to know about that, you're going to have to read the book too. But, um, but here, I'm going to um, read just a little bit from the end. Right now, the subject of the future is rife with anxiety. Visions of apocalypse dance in our heads. The topic of the Anthropocene is often associated with doom and gloom, with an, is the earth fucked mentality. This is understandable, but it's not the whole story. Let's not dwell on these prophecies to the point where they become self-fulfilling. I propose that, on the contrary, the true Anthropocene is something that should be welcomed. Though it is yet only in its infancy, it can be glimpsed. Don't fear it. Learn to shape it. It is the awareness of ourselves as geological change agents that, once propagated and integrated, will provide us with the capacity to avoid doom and take our future into our own hands. Understandably, we are uncomfortable with our role as reluctant planetary engineers. Discomfort sometimes manifests as self-loathing and denial. But this is our task, and we can't afford to wallow. It's time to human up. We have to stand and face it, get up on our big bipedal frames and look in the mirror, wake up to find out that we are the eyes of the world. Earlier in this chapter, I described flavors of pessimism. There are flavors of optimism, too. There's cosmic optimism, stemming from a belief that the universe in its vastness bends toward life and intelligence, and that what happens here doesn't really matter anyway because there's plenty more where we come from. There's data-driven and historically-based optimism, which focuses on positive indicators, of which there are many. Poverty, malnutrition, and infant mortality are all in retreat globally. Levels of education are on the rise. Communication continues to become cheaper and easier. Population is plausibly heading towards stability. Solar and wind energy are getting cheaper and will continue to do so. These are all trends toward human freedom and environmental sustainability. There's pragmatic optimism. We really don't know what is going to happen, so why not spread hope and encourage engagement? Exponential technological innovation is transforming our world in surprising and accelerating ways. Possibilities that until recently seemed magical are now imminent, rendering the future frightening and exhilarating, but above all, unpredictable. Where there is uncertainty, there is also hope and choice and room for faith in ourselves. I believe we're just getting started on this planet. 
Nobody knows the odds of our being able to navigate the evolutionary obstacles before us, but there is a real hope, and it is this, that our evolving technological capacities can allow us to maximize our innate social prowess, equipping us to meet the novel threats we have accidentally created and to become something new in the process. We have done this before. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you're right about our being terra sapiens, but suppose we're terra sophomores, and uh, if you could speak for the Earth, you would say, uh, man is a parasite using up my resources, and I'm gonna shrug him off. Yeah, well, so the, the notion of a parasite is interesting. One thing I talk about in this this last chapter that I just read a little bit, is the metaphors we use to describe ourselves. And we do tend to often use these metaphors of disease or criminality, we're a virus, a parasite, we're uh, raping the rainforest, we're murdering the biosphere. And you know, it's, it's easy to see where those metaphors come from, there's some real truth in that. Uh, and yet, it's not necessarily the whole truth because um, we, are different from, say, a cancer, too, and that cancers don't get together in a room and have a conversation and say, oh, look what we're doing. Maybe we shouldn't be, be a cancer, you know? So, so one thing I do is I point out those metaphors and then I suggest some other metaphors. Um, the metaphor of adolescence, of, um, you know, going through a reckless phase, and, and, and the, which implies also the possibility of maturity. And I think I provide some examples that are actually pretty good of, of glimmers of that as well. The metaphor of the, um, of, of the sleepwalker, you know, where you're, you're waking up in the middle of discovering yourself doing some horrible act, and then going, whoa, what, what are we doing here? Or, the, the, you know, driving the big rig down the road, or suddenly realize you are and going, but I don't know how to drive, you know? But, well, I better, learn fast because this is a windy road and everything and everybody I care about is, is in the truck here with me, right? So um, I, I caution against um, just assuming that, that we are, that our past behavior has to determine our future patterns, especially because there are, I think, some good examples if you go into our deep history and even in our recent history of learning to behave in other ways. And you know, I'll, let, let me say one thing about climate change because because um, I didn't get a chance to say this and because I think we don't have much chance for, for a lot more questions, but I know somebody wants to ask me about um, the uh, asteroid that's gonna hit tomorrow um, and whether we can survive that, uh, whether we can survive four years of uh, unenlightened policy in one country that's 20% of the, the world's economy. Um, let me just say a couple quick things about that. One, um, the president doesn't determine climate policy, which we found to unfortunate effect over the last eight years. That will also be true over the next four years. It's happening mostly at the state and local level, and there are inexorable economic forces that are unleashed on the world now, which will make it true, for instance, that coal is not coming back no matter what anybody says on the campaign trail. Coal is on its way out. The Chinese just announced this last week that they're canceling 200 coal plants and they announced about a month ago that they are putting um, 300 million new dollars into uh, uh, alternative energy. I find that tremendously hopeful because we are not the whole world and the fact is that Chinese, I think they're gonna solve this problem because you cannot breathe in Beijing right now. I mean, just self-interest. But ultimately, that's all we need is selfishness on, on a large level by the powerful players who, you know, you can be as selfish as, as you want and you still realize that it's not a good idea to soil your own crib. You know, and that's what we're talking about cognitively is it's not really that gonna be, it's not really that hard. It's just learning like a child learns not to soil themselves. That's all we have to do collectively. And you know, here's the thing. People tend to think of it as this cliff we're gonna go off or we're not gonna go off. But really, there is, oh, look at this. <laughs> Pay no attention to any of that stuff. Um, there, there is, here, I'll just pull this out so you can't read my financial report. Um, <laughs> There, there is going to be a 22nd and a 23rd century. Hum, humans are not gonna be wiped off the face of the planet. By the 22nd century, we will be completely off of fossil fuels. 
That is true even if we're as dumb as dumb can be and just drill baby drill and find every molecule of organic carbon and burn it. There's still, we'll still be off fossil fuels in 100 years. Um, so it's a question of how we're gonna get from here to there and how much or how little pain we do along the way, how much damage we do along the way. Population is stabilizing for the right reasons because fertility is going down globally because poverty is declining and in particular, um, in societies where women have more choices over their own lives, um, fertility uh, modulates. So, you know, if you want to do something about population, the thing you can do most powerfully is support education of girls in poor countries. But that's happening. The global trends are all in the right direction there. So, um, the way I look at it is the 21st century, if we do this the wrong way, is going to be potentially as bad as the 20th century. And when I say that, people say, what are you talking about? The 20th century was great. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe it was for you and your, your people, but what about for the 100 million or more people that died in famines and wars? And, you know, it wasn't all that great. That's the scale of tragedy I think we're facing in the 21st century. And we are obligated to do everything we can to reduce it and mitigate it. And so it's, to me, it's not a cliff we're going to go off. It's a path to get from here to there. And it's a question of, we can do this the easy way or the hard way, and it's how much pain and displacement and damage we do. But I do think there'll come a time in the 22nd century when we're in the process of repairing that damage and we're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which there are ways to do, there will be better ways to do it. And we'll look back on this time and think, how could they have been so dumb to be driving around in these vehicles that are wrecking the natural systems that they depend on? It, it, it's not that hard, you know? So. I think that um, my long-term view is optimistic, but I actually think with, with good reason. And on the short term, I'm very concerned about the problems we're facing. They're real and they're serious. And I think, you know, one of the mark of, uh, supposedly the marks of maturity is being able to carry two seemingly contradictory thoughts or views in your head at the same time. And what I urge is that we have a vision of where we want to go in the future and it can be a positive vision. It's not enough to think of what kind of world we want to avoid. Let's think of what role we want to get to, what world we want to get to, and carry that vision with us even as we face these very frightening uh, near-term threats and, you know, and, and, and uh, fight those battles with all we've got. So, um, okay, sorry, we're at time. I'm, I'm gonna hang around though if you want to talk and sign books and stuff. <laughs>